This is Duke University. We decided to um, debate it here and first intro with a Bitcoin 101 session, which will be led primarily by Matt Corolla. Um, he'll be conducting the majority of the Bitcoin 101 session, and the rest of the team and I will be here to assist with questions. Matt is a computer science student at UNC and has been involved with Bitcoin for the past three years now. In fact, he's become one of the top contributors to the core client and is a developer on the Bitcoin project. As only a junior in college, he has had a significant impact on off-chain trustless microtransactions, making him one of the few people in the world with experience on Bitcoin-based contract protocols. So without further ado, Matt. Hey, so I'm going to try to fill in a few of the holes that Conan might have left. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to frame this in the uh, aspect of kind of the history of digital currency. This is, a, is actually a rich history there. And then kind of go into a bit more detail on specifics for Bitcoin and kind of some general concepts that you should be aware of when you're thinking about Bitcoin. And then we'll briefly cover some implications and open it up for questions and then have a panel discussion. Uh, so, history of digital currency, there's been a subculture called the cypherpunks who are really into digital currencies and kind of how we can create pseudo cash for the internet all the way back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, started with Xiaomi tokens in the very early 80s and there's a lot of discussion about how to kind of create programmable cash. Uh, out of that came a lot of centralized digital currencies and even not out of that, uh, there's a ton of them. You can think of it as anything from your Venmo balance, which you use to pay your friends, to web money, which was used exclusively for money laundering and got shut down, to your Facebook credits, which might be a closed system, to maybe your second life, I think, has a digital currency within the game. Uh, but no one really solved creating one of these distributed. So all of these centralized currencies had some nice properties that you could interface with them digitally and have nice... Uh, programmable cash potentially in some of them, but all of them required some central authority to provide the network with knowledge of who has what money and kind of verify all the transactions. So Bitcoin came along and solved this problem for the first time in 2009, something that had been kind of discussed and attempted at since the 80s, and really solved one major problem. So the one problem that was really blocking all of these decentralized digital currencies, which is what's called the double spend problem. And it goes back to a fairly fundamental issue in computer science. If you're a computer science major, you've probably heard of the uh, Byzantine generals problem. And Bitcoin solved this for a fairly specific case. And uh, to kind of illustrate this problem, I'm going to do kind of a thought experiment here. So you have all your Bitcoins on your computer. And you take your computer to the Apple store or whatever, and you get your computer cloned. So they just copy your hard drive and put it in the second computer. So you now have two computers that are the same. Well, you now have your Bitcoin on both computers. And if you go on both your computers and you create a transaction, one of them to Bob and one of them to Alice, and you send them out to the network at the same time, how does anyone know whether Bob has the money that you sent or Alice? In fact, you really can't without a central party. So you can think of it like you write two checks and you give them to different people. One of them might bounce and one of them won't. And you have a central party, which is your bank, to decide which one goes through and which one bounces, whichever one gets to the bank first. Uh, Bitcoin solved this problem and enabled us to do this without some central authority. And we'll get into a bit of the technical details there a bit later, but it gets kind of hairy. Uh, you can ask more details if you want. Uh, so fundamentally, Bitcoin implements micro or trustless transactions between two parties. You have, just without a central authority, you can send value from party A to party B across the internet, across some network. But it also supports kind of more of the cypherpunk ideals of programmable cash. So you can really do a lot of advanced things without trust, uh, self-enforcing contracts, all kinds of really fun things that you can ask the panel about if you're more interested in, they can fill you in a lot. Um, just directly on Bitcoin without a government enforcing or a court enforcing your contract. Uh, one final note, it's important to note that Bitcoin has 21 million. That's all there ever will be. That's all there ever, right now we're at 11 have been created, I believe, or so. 
and there will never be more than 21. Every computer that's on the Bitcoin network will enforce this rule. And it's just interesting from a financial perspective because we no longer have potential for inflation. It's a purely deflationary currency. Uh, so to get into some of the kind of key components of Bitcoin that you should be aware of when you're thinking about and kind of discussing Bitcoin, uh, there's a few important parts. We're going to start with the transaction block. So what happens is you have all these transactions that people have created and miners collect them and put them in one big block. So we create, we take all the transactions, we send them out to everyone and everyone gets the entire transaction history in these blocks and they become part of this chain. So each block points to the previously existing one and you create this long chain of transaction blocks, which provides the order, which we noted was the most important and single important part of creating a decentralized currency. So we have this chain, which is every transaction ever and provide some canonical ordering of transactions. So you can say if it came, if A came before B in the chain and B was a double spend of A, then B is invalid because A came before it. Uh, so as I mentioned, this process is called mining. And this is literally just, you take all of the transactions that people are rumoring around. People say, I want to spend Alice, uh, give Alice some Bitcoins, and miners take this and put it in some long chain. Uh, so as a reward for providing the security, it's kind of the fundamental security of Bitcoin, we give miners both small transaction fees, which will become more important in the future, but also they are the creators of new Bitcoin. So out of the 21 million block, we give miners chunks of new Bitcoin because they're providing kind of the useful service to the network. Uh, over time, mining has become very specialized. So it used to be you could do mining on your computer, but it's now very special hardware in some data center in Iceland ends up doing the majority of mining because it just gets expensive and you can do it a whole lot faster if you have more expensive hardware. So to move back from the network a bit and kind of towards what individuals be, will be looking at, uh, we have Bitcoin addresses, which you can think of similar to a bank routing number, except you can't pull money out, you can only send money to one. So you have this private key, which is kind of a fundamental cryptographic concept, which was invented, I believe, back in the 70s or 60s. And the idea is you can create some signature, which is completely unforgeable, which you have a private key, which creates a signature, which proves that you are the owner of a given address. And that's how you send money. So if you sign that I wish to give money to Bob and you use your private key, then people can verify that the given address or the person who owns the given address indeed wish to send money to Bob. So it's important to note that, as I mentioned, every transaction ever is completely public. So what you see, you can go on websites, there's a number of them, and you can see actually every transaction from address A to address B. Uh, so it provides very little anonymity. You might have heard that Bitcoin's completely anonymous. It's really not. Every transaction is public. And if it weren't for the fact that creating new Bitcoin addresses was free, you would have zero privacy whatsoever. So actually what happens is most wallets create an address every time you want to receive money, every time you send money, they just create addresses as often as they can because otherwise you would have zero privacy. So it tries to obscure a lot of your uh, financial doings and you can actually get decent privacy that way. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, you have this wallet. So the wallet is what creates all your addresses, it manages your addresses, it also tracks all your transactions, and most importantly, it keeps track of your private keys. So as I mentioned, your private keys can sign away your money. Private keys is what's used to send your money. So if you lose your private keys, if your private keys are stolen, you're screwed. Someone can take all your money. You might have lost all your money. Your computer crashed. You kind of lost your money. You have to back up uh, your private keys. So this is kind of one of the aspects of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin's very new. This is one of the many aspects of Bitcoin that's kind of very young and fairly immature. It's getting a lot better very quickly. There's a lot smarter ways to store private keys and we're seeing those appear. But for now, uh, the majority of programs that run on your computer that store your private keys are just storing them in a file and a virus will come along and steal your money. 
Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over and discuss briefly some of the implications of what Bitcoin might provide. These are um, a lot of the key um, buzz phrases, I guess you would hear, on ways that Bitcoin can revolutionize the way we see the world today. Um, they're possibilities, not necessarily um, definite, but good, thing to, good things to think about. So first and foremost, um, one of the largest implications of the Bitcoin process is there are little to no fees. It's like uh, 0.001% or something along those lines. And so with this elimination of fees, basically uh, Bitcoin in and of itself is very international. So you can instantaneously transfer a, um, money inherently from one country to another across the globe with very little transaction fees. Um, furthermore, um, if you were to go to a merchant and use your debit card or credit card to pay for something, the process of transferring the money from your bank account to that merchant, in that process there are four to five different people, entities, that charge fees in that process. And so by allowing Bitcoin to facilitate that transaction, you eliminate those fees. And for these merchants who are operating on very slim margins, this could have huge implications for the bottom line. Furthermore, there would be potentially a huge revolution to the marketplace in that credit cards and institutional banks would be forced to compete with these new um, interest rates. So you could see a, um, a transference from power from the financial system as we know it to one that is inherently based on digital currency. <coughs> and then furthermore, another implication of Bitcoin would be the fact that it's infinitely divisible. Um, it's not, I mean, it doesn't go to infinity, but I believe you can get down to one one millionth of a penny, so to speak, or one one millionth of a Bitcoin. Um, this has incredible implications for our day-to-day our -day life, potentially. So, for example, you could charge um, people to send you an email. So you could eliminate spam, essentially, from your inbox, because for every one email someone sends you, they may have to pay one ten-thousandth of a cent. If that were the case, it's no big deal to you. You hardly even notice the cost. However, to those companies who are spamming 200 million people in one day, it's quite a large sum of money they'd have to pay on a daily basis, and so you might eliminate things like spam. Furthermore, um, it has implications for online articles. If you think of all the BuzzFeed articles, for example, you may read day to day. Um, if you had a, a charge, so to speak, for a page or per view of a fraction of a cent, again, you would hardly even notice it in your own bank account, but they could amass a decent sum of money per article. Um, furthermore, it has implications for charity. So there actually was a guy who took a, um, a poster board at a baseball game, I believe, and said, send me Bitcoin, and had his address or a, a certain code to get there, and he received $25,000 worth of Bitcoin just by advertising this over a public television network. And so the implications of this are, you know, why they're very open in that you could have a, um, for example, a student, or not a student, a child in Africa, or a village in Africa that could use some funds, use some help. And you could have one picture of a person with this um, address and say, send me Bitcoin. You might be able to immediately send them funds and help out that, that entity. And then finally, there are implications in terms of the trading world. People have been looking for, traders specifically have been looking for ways to trade equities, bonds, commodities, et cetera, in fractions of pennies, and haven't yet, they have not yet been able to do so. And with this, there is a potential to be able to accomplish that. Furthermore, through Bitcoin, this is the, an area with lots of potential. As you can see here, these are several companies that pertain to Bitcoin, and they're all startups. And I know Jeremy wanted to speak a bit about the companies on this slide, but it's, it's meant to show that there's a lot of potential here to um, learn the concept yourself and maybe start your own company. So um, thank you again, everybody, for coming out today. We know it's a Saturday. and. Um, as you can see, there are a number of companies that most of these probably you've never heard of uh, right now. They're startups. They're just getting off the ground. A lot of what we've learned about Bitcoin in the last six months, the last year, um, you know, we, we are still learning a lot about it. Matt has been working on this longer than any of the rest of us, um, but you're not very far behind in, if you want to catch up and you want to be on the leading edge of building a company or building a product in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So a number of these companies, BitPay, we have Eric here today from BitPay. Um, Coinbase, blockchain, um, we have, uh, most of these companies are either in the, the wallet space, the merchant space, merchant processing, or in the exchange space. Um, Coinbase is a wallet company, but they also have, um, do, do some merchant processing. BitPay is really focused on merchants, on helping businesses make money um, and, and accept Bitcoin. Blockchain has a wallet. Um, Circle is this company that uh, Jeremy Allaire is a, uh, an entrepreneur that started a couple other companies. He's got a really good reputation, 
and nobody really knows what he's building yet, but he went out and raised a bunch of money and the fact that he has a reputation and there's this big space and investors, VC investors now re recognize that there's a huge space and a huge uh, amount of opportunity in this space. He was able to raise a bunch of money and just go build something. Um, Kraken is an exchange, Bitstamp is an exchange in, in Europe. Um, and Bitwall <laughs> is actually a company, what they do is they create a um, just a payment wall. So whenever you show up, the I think the best use cases or the best example is the Chicago Sun Times used the Bitwall uh, payment wall. So when you show up, like you do on New York Times or any of these other sites, when you read three or four articles, they ask you to pay something, and they allowed you to donate uh, Bitcoin. I think it went to a charity, but you could pay in Bitcoin on Chicago Sun Times. Just last week or two weeks ago, Chicago Sun Times is now the first newspaper to accept Bitcoin. Uh, purely just as payment for the newspaper. So that experiment went obviously went well. Um, Bitwall is actually founded by a Duke alum, Nick Melionis. Um, I'm not I'm unsure of what year he is from, but it's it's in the last four or five years. He's a pretty young guy. Um, Coinbase also is founded by another Duke alum from Trinity 2010. So there's a lot that can happen, um, and one of the reasons that we wanted to kind of share a lot of this info about Bitcoin, and we invited these speakers here today, is to uh, to make sure everybody knows and, and, and make sure that you guys know that there's a lot of opportunity right now. If you learn some, you do research on, on Bitcoin um, to whatever jobs you're going to go into, whether it's finance, whether it's consulting, um, whether you actually want to go start a company, start a tech startup. There's a lot of opportunity right now to go build a lot of different products and kind of get into the ecosystem early on. So um, how can you get involved? Um, if you want to accept Bitcoin at your business, uh, BitPay is focused on merchants. Eric, do you want to come say just a couple words about BitPay? <laughs> so uh, I'm a developer evangelist at BitPay, uh, and what we do is... is record it. So I'm Eric Martindale. I'm the developer evangelist at BitPay. Uh, we're an open source company at our core. Uh, we want to get a lot of people building things on top of our platform uh, and the technologies that we've developed. We've been around for about three years and are exclusively focused on helping businesses accept Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin being an international currency, it immediately opens up the ability for any merchant anywhere in the world to accept payment for their goods or services. And this is one of the real core values of crypto finance in general, and in our case, specifically Bitcoin. So today we process about a million dollars a day in transactions using Bitcoin. For a little bit over the 27 million customers at this point, uh, or 27 million, mer 27,000 merchants actually, um, and the transaction values range from you know one or two dollars for a digital download on like a uh, a service or a site that you might provide to uh, Virgin Galactic is one of our customers. People can buy tickets to space uh, with Bitcoin and have um, our average transaction is about 400 dollars. People have bought Lamborghinis and. Target Direct, for example, if you're going to go make a new computer purchase, maybe you're going to be buying some mining hard hardware or something like that. Uh, Target Direct also accepts Bitcoin. We just make it very simple. You tell, you charge us. You you basically say what the price of your good is in U.S. dollars or any number of 130 different uh, fiat currencies at this point, and we figure out what the exchange rate is in Bitcoin. We collect that amount of Bitcoin from your customer, and then deposit fiat fiat currency directly to your bank. So it doesn't matter if you as a business particularly care about Bitcoin, but if you're like any of the other businesses out there, people are starting to ask, well, do you guys accept Bitcoin yet? There's a lot of people out there with Bitcoin that want to spend it. Uh, if you take a look at the value of Bitcoin today, it's, uh, what is it, $460 this morning, uh, times the number of Bitcoin that are out there, and you have a very large spending power continuing to get larger. Uh, if your customers are asking you, you know, how can you accept Bitcoin? BitPay would be the company you come to, and we just handle all that for you, and you can do business as usual. Thank you. All right. Um, so we, we also have one other way. We talked to uh, Fred Arisman. We, we invited him out, but he's um, out in San Francisco and, and couldn't make it out. But he did um, send us an email address, and uh, they've set up an account. So if you email duke at coinbase.com, we wanted to give you guys an opportunity to actually interact with Bitcoin and uh, create accounts. And Coinbase is this company that they're focused on the consumer side. They do some merchant services as well, but they have uh, one of the best wallet programs out there. So if you email right now, it doesn't matter what you put in the subject line 
or in the, uh, the body of the email. Um, and it doesn't matter really the email address. It doesn't have to be a Duke email address. Um, but if you email right now, duke at coinbase.com, it will automatically create an account and it will send you an email back with a link that you can log in and set up your account. And uh, they will also send you uh, 0.01 BTC, which is equivalent to about five bucks. So I'm gonna leave that up um, for a minute. That's, uh, do we have anything else? Uh, that's the end of, of kind of the basics of Bitcoin. Um, and now we'll, we'll open it up if you guys have questions. Uh, we do have a panel after this where we're gonna get into some more kind of high level topics and expert topics on, um, on Bitcoin. And we have several great speakers here today. Um, so if you can right now focus the questions on kind of what Bitcoin is, and then we'll get into questions about the marketplace and the ecosystem and a lot of those kinds of things um, when we can also include our experts in the conversation. So is that, is it on? Did you I believe so. check the, so does anybody have, anybody have any questions? Uh, they can line up. Yeah, if you can line up and actually talk to the mic, we're recording this too. So we can share it with some other people if anybody has anything. Just hold the bot on the bottom, hold it down. Got it. Yeah. So, anything? Anybody? Everyone's an expert on Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of the panelists, but I have a question for Matt. Yep. Um, you mentioned the, the solving the double spend problem. Yeah. Um, so, you clone your computer and you put two um, transactions out there versus you write two checks and um, basically the first one gets cashed. What, what is the difference? Because only one check will get cashed and when you go out into the Bitcoin network, only one transaction will go through. Yeah, so what, what's, I mean, what's the big deal? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty fundamentally the same issue. Uh, the, really, the big deal is that you don't trust some central party. Uh, so you're not trusting a bank. You know, in this country, we have a reasonably good banking system. But there's a lot of countries where you don't really want to trust any of the banks that you have access to ever because they're all pretty terrible. So <laughs> if you... If, you know, if you're in one of these countries or if you just don't want to trust anyone or you want to have some big decentralized thing that's global, that you can trust a global thing with a bunch of different parties versus trusting one individual company in your jurisdiction, uh, you can go to this network which will provide the same service of just picking whichever one came first, but it's not some centralized institution. How many of you in here actually like your banks? <laughs> I see maybe Three, two four, up, oh, five, six, okay, okay. there's okay. a few. <laughs> so the, the idea of Bitcoin in general is that you can remove the trust in these systems that have so wronged you in the past. These bank, banking institutions have effectively locked down your fees, they can lock your account, prevent you from doing business. Uh, what Bitcoin introduces is this idea of decentralization and removal of trust from any one central entity. So now you can do business with anyone at any time without anybody else's permission. And that's really the fundamental power of it. Awesome. All right, we've got one question here. So you mentioned that there's currently 11 million of Bitcoin. And there's going to be a total of 21 million ever created. Yeah. Can you talk about the process of how these Bitcoins are going to be created? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, newly minted Bitcoins are go to miners, uh, which again provide this protection against double spend. So in exchange for their services, they're allowed to create the new value. Uh, so what it is, it's, it's a fairly simple exponential function. It's just uh, in the beginning, every Bitcoin block was worth 50 Bitcoins. So every time you created a block, you got 50 new Bitcoins. Uh, and then it halves every uh, 21,000, 210,000 blocks. Uh, so right now, every time you create a new block, you get 25, and then every four years, which is 21,000 or 210,000 or something like that, uh, it halves. So it'll be 15 or 15 and a half or 12 and a half bitcoins, and then it continues to have until it is zero per new block, and then you're relying on transaction fees to incentivize miners, or potentially external systems to incentivize miners. And when will that when will it be? Oh. Do you know the year 2140? 2140 is the year that it will hit zero.
So effectively, it asymptotically decreases towards the total production of 21 million coins. Uh, simultaneously, the inverse takes place for transactions uh, and how the transaction fees help disperse the money throughout the network. <coughs> Sure. Okay. Um, so you guys are talking about how um, Bitcoin is great because it's this decentralization um, of not having to use banks anymore, correct? Okay. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how secure these like on online wallets are for Bitcoin? Um, yeah, so online wallets are an interesting concept. Um, you know, they're competing with keep your private keys on your computer. So if your computer crashes or your computer is stolen or you get a virus, you're screwed. Uh, so they're a whole lot better than that because now you have an online account kind of similar. You can log into your bank and send money from your bank online. <laughs> well, you can log into Coinbase or blockchain or whoever and send money from them online. Uh, some of them do some, they get a bit better. They try to encrypt your private key so only you have access to them and they don't have access to your money. Um, so they're a lot more secure, but you're still trusting someone to hold your money for you, essentially. So if we, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to do it better, and we're seeing that there's uh, you can do some really awesome stuff fundamentally with Bitcoin. As I said, it's kind of programmable cash, so you can do things like you require two out of three private keys in order to spend it. So maybe you require your phone and your computer, or your phone and your bank. Uh, these kinds of things, you can get a lot better security. None of them are quite there yet, but as I said, you know, this it's kind of blowing up. It's uh, getting a lot bigger, and you saw all the startups, a, a few of them are working on kind of similar technologies to make these things a lot more secure, because Bitcoin can be incredibly secure. It's all right. thing with all of the, um, all the problems that you see, like I, I kind of, as you cascade down, you create one company, and then that, as Bitcoin expands, it might create more problems. And so with online wallets, you have other security problems. There are, I, I believe there's a company in the UK that's trying to create an, some sort of insurance product or this vault product for storing your Bitcoins. Um, so there are, as there are more problems pop up, companies will pop up to hopefully solve those problems. And that's, that's why there's a lot of opportunity. So, yeah, so I think we have time for one, uh, maybe two more questions. So anybody else? Then we have one here. Yeah. So my question is regarding like you said, the miners are the only people like who can you know mint, who can get earn these new bitcoins. So is there any other other way to you know mint these bitcoins? Yeah. Or so I mean, the how can people get involved? In, like, can it like we get involved in mining, or you need like specific? Yeah. So mining is very decentralized. Anyone can mine if you have an internet connection. You can mine uh, in history, so when Bitcoin first came out, for the first number of years, it was really anyone with a computer can mine and make some small amount per month. Uh, now if you were to mine on your computer, you're going to make zero per month, or almost exactly zero per month. Uh, so it does require some specialized hardware. You can buy it online. Uh, you can buy hardware from, there's a few companies that make this hardware, uh, but you just have to have that and a power supply and an internet connection, and you can be a miner. Uh, of course, you can always buy Bitcoin in the U.S. Coinbase is kind of the best option or one of the best options. Sign up there, or get an account. Uh, you can buy with credit card, I think, if you link your bank account or something like that. All right, yeah. uh, all right so one more, and then we're going to transition to the panel and have a bit more in-depth discussion about all kinds of issues. Um, my question is not really technical, but my question is, so where do you see Bitcoin going? Because the ways it interfaces with like political spheres <laughs> makes it go, the value of Bitcoin goes up and down. Like a few months ago, it was a thousand bucks and now it's 400-ish. Yeah. yeah, so let's actually save this question and we can transition, bring this right up in the panel. Right. Uh, give these guys an opportunity to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Yeah.